of the uh, boot camp. And I am delighted to uh, introduce Val Tannen, who is uh, going to tell us about uh, algebraic abstraction. As you know, uh, in order to build a database or, uh, say, a query optimizer, you're going to need uh, a few abstractions, uh, algorithmic ones, um, algebraic uh, ones, and, uh, um, you know, including in order to kind of debug, you know, if you write a query and you would like to know what's going on uh, in the middle of execution, you will need some kind of provenance information in order to know, you know, uh, uh, trace the execution path. So the, this abstraction is going to help us uh, with that too. So, uh, uh, well. thank you very much. Uh, quite right, Ang. Uh, this indeed, uh, uh, one hopes uh, there are even more applications perhaps than we thought about. I will introduce a different motivation um, that also uh, goes to you'd like to know what's going on. I think that is something that uh, we all want to uh, have a good idea when uh, we uh, query databases. Uh, so this is uh, part of a series of four lectures. And uh, as in the first and second day, um, we are grouped together in four lectures. But um, Ours are actually both morning. We're both morning people, I suppose, Dan. And uh, I'll uh, give the first two this morning, and Dan will give the next two uh, tomorrow morning. And this is what uh, uh, we're going to talk about. Um, so uh, it's difficult uh, because I, I will have to be immodest for a for a while, maybe some of you think that that's it. Um, algebraic methods have been applied successfully in database theory. And uh, what uh, I'm going to begin with is to survey one application that uh, I think uh, justifies um, that uh, the, the claim that algebraic methods uh, can be very helpful. Um, when we started this work in 2007, this was a little less clear, but um, there were also some supporting, there was uh, some supporting research around those years. But uh, since then, I was absolutely delighted to see that, um, that um, this uh, abstract understanding has actually helped us uh, in a variety of ways. And you'll see, in fact, some... Uh, uh, a perspective that uh, I love that Dan will present tomorrow. So uh, the overwhelming motivation originally for what I'm going to tell you about uh, was data sharing. Uh, so this is an old story in databases. Uh, when, when I started working seriously in databases, when my colleague Peter Bunemann converted me from programming language uh, theory, uh, this was the big deal. It was called actually data integration, but in fact, you know, these are related topics. Um, and uh, here we are uh, 30 years later, more than 30 years later, and it's still not clear that data integration is a completely satisfactorily solved uh, issue. Um, so data sharing uh, appears in several guises. When people build warehouses, collecting data from various sources. Um, and a good example that we were very much uh, uh, motivated by is collaborating scientists. So uh, the first uh, project that uh, was done with this was called Orchestra. It was the uh, brainchild of my colleague, Zach Ives. And, uh, the semi-ring uh, framework for database provenance was developed in order to support um, this idea of data sharing in order to, for let's say a bunch of scientists who exchange information uh, to understand how to deal with each other. I will explain with, a, I hope not too simplistic uh, example. So, uh, Let's say that uh, you know I can I can only uh, take in vain uh, the name of a few people, but uh, I feel comfortable with Dan and Sudipa. <laughs> so, so let's say that Dan and uh, Val are zoologists who just collect information 
and then uh, has determined uh, without any doubt that cats eat mice and rats. And Val has determined that uh, he's, a, he's a color specialist, so he's determined that mice are gray and red, okay, and rats are gray. Now, Sudipa, on the other hand, uh, it, and, and there are many more scientists nowadays are data scientists, and they are, I'd like to call them computational scientists. That is, they're not going in the field there to, to chase mice to see what color they have. They just collect data from a whole bunch of other people who do create these data sources, and then they create information by integrating it. So that's an aspect of data sharing. And Sudipa, looking at Dan's notes and Val's notes, um, determines that for some reason, okay, this, uh, the concept here is, is quite uh, bizarre. For some reason, Sudipa is interested in the color of the food of animals. So based on this information, Sudipa determines computationally that cats eat both gray and red food, okay? Now, uh, at the same time, when scientists collaborate, they have different opinions about each other's reliability. That's a very serious problem, uh, not just in this uh, funny example, but uh, in reality. And so, uh, you know, for various reasons, uh, she has her doubts about some of Val's work, in particular, that mice are red, <laughs> and uh, but she has, you know, great trust in Dan's work. So she would like to annotate her data with trust. And the first approach to this would be quite simplistic. We're just going to label the tuples as trust or don't trust. So the Y's, which are supposed to be green, how green are they then? <laughs> the Y's mean yes, okay, so um, what Sudipa does, you know, presumably Dan doesn't have an opinion about how good his data is, but what Sudipa does is whatever she imports, we, she imports those tuples from Dan, she uh, labels them that yes, trust. Uh, she has obtained uh, through the grapevine the information that Val's data about mice is highly suspicious. So she labels with N from no, the, the two tuples about the color of mice. Uh, but she also heard that Val's information about rats is more reliable, so she said, okay. So the question is, given these annotations on the two data sources, Dan and Val's, uh, how should Sudipa compute, or her algorithms, how should they compute um, annotations on her data? What, of her, what part of her data is to be trusted and what not? So now, obviously, the cat eating red stuff, that's, uh, you know, not to be trusted. But here is an interesting situation. It is still to be trusted that cats eat gray food. And why is that? That's because of the rats, which are gray, not because of the mice, which are gray. So this, you see, um, already introduces the idea that there are alternative ways of deriving data that we need to somehow capture. Okay. Uh, it turns out that I'm uh, going to... Yes? I didn't understand what was there at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, this is a calculation of yes <coughs> as a Boolean combination of yes and no. Uh, think of them as false and true. No, it isn't. So no is y and no. So if, if no is false, then, you know, there's conjunction here. It says, well, perhaps I am confused, but it says both, it can be yes and no. These are the annotations of Sudipa's tuples, computed from the annotations of Val's and Dan's tuples, using a kind of Boolean combination. Okay, 
So, so for the moment, I'm just proposing this as an intuitive thing. Okay. And maybe if so, that's all that Sudipa does with her data, it doesn't maybe need a lot of uh, sophisticated framework, except these kind of calculations. OK? All right. But it turns out that um, you can also think of other uh, applications. And one would be, for example, access control. And here it is perhaps Dan and Val who actually have labels of some of their data. And Sudipa agrees that they, you know, there are certain uh, controls on how much the data will be shared. So for Dan, who is you know, a reliable, generous scientist, makes his data P public. And Val, who, you know, already his science is a little suspicious, um, labels the mouse information T from top secret. So he's going to share it only with people that like him. And, uh, but uh, when it comes to, to the rat information, he labels it C for confidential. More generally, you can have a hierarchy like this of, of access control scores. Um, that you can label public, confidential, secret, uh, top secret. And the problem is, how does uh, Sudipa, if, if she agrees, you know, to follow the desires of uh, the sources where she gets the data, how should she label her <laughs> output tuples? And uh, notice that um, she would like to label the information about cat eating red food, to label it as top secret. And that's because Val's information here about mice being red is top secret. And that's the only way, only with this top secret information can you get the fact that cats eat red stuff. On the other hand, when you get to saying cats eat gray stuff, you can also get it through the rat information. And that's only confidential, so it doesn't have to be labeled top secret. Okay. Well, I'm also trying to amuse you. Come on. <laughs> yes. uh, now, this is uh, very sort of uh, categorical, but in fact, um, in reality, people do not have binary opinions about trust. They have confidence scores. And uh, you'd like to work with those as well. So, for example, let's say that dance tuples, uh, we have a confidence of 0.9. So, confidence scores here are between 0 and 1. 0.9, um, and we have a 0.6 confidence in the mouse being gray, and 0.1 only confidence in the mouse being red, and 0.8 for the rat. And then you'd like to again propagate these confidence scores into the output somehow. And here is one possible calculation that you can do. I'm not saying it's the only one, but it does fit our semi-ring frame framework, and that's why I'm selling it. Uh, when you actually use two tuples, so for example, the fact that cat eats mouse and mouse is red, you multiply 0 0.9 with 0 0.1. That is, you multiply the con uh, confidence scores, which makes sense in a sort of not quite probabilistic sense, but similar if they are independent in some sense. But at the same time, um, you also know that uh, rat is gray and cat eats rat, and that's a much better confidence score, 0 0.9 times 0 0.8, that's 0 0.72. And then how do you compare the two? Which one should you choose? The proposal is to choose the maximum. Yes, Hans? Uh, um, does the algebra work for um, the previous example, uh, the access control for the No, um, not quite. So there is a problem with, with negation, which I'm not, okay, so they, that's earlier. So uh, I had to make some choices. I can give a whole one hour talk about how to deal with negation. I will have some things to say at the very end. But for the moment, uh, all the queries that we are considering do not uh, use negative information. And they, they are, let's say, a positive relational algebra. Um, and they also, we, this also works for data log, but you're going to hear from Dan tomorrow about it. Okay. So, um, 
the story of how data depends, how outputs depend on inputs, um, has gotten from Peter Bunemann the lovely name provenance. Actually, his joke is uh, that uh, lineage uh, is for kings. And you're not going to believe this, but some, some scientists actually refer to what we call lineage and provenance in databases, they refer to it as pedigree. And now, pedigree, Peter says, is, of course, for dogs and horses. And provenance is the elegant uh, word for it because, you know, it's for works of art. So anyway, I'm, I'm in the provenance camp, although I do know that there are some people who make it a point to use the word lineage. Um, so, so provenance, that is this kind of relationship, is trying to capture how so deep as data depends on uh, the input data from that and now. But how? Uh, we try to capture provenance as an abstract way of describing this dependence. And the previous examples, these three examples that I gave you, I can use them as sanity checks or as sort of things to generalize from. Um, and what I would like to do, and that's really very important, is I, I would like to use provenance only once. And then the previous examples, I'd like to specialize them from provenance so that I don't have to do the provenance calculate the, the tracking through the queries all the time. I can just look at the final result and evaluate provenance for a particular application like trust in those uh, with those uh, confidence scores or access control, or we shall see some other applications. So to do that, we will abstractly label the input tuples. Uh, for lack of a better name, we call these abstract labels provenance tokens. And then what you'd like to do is to propagate this provenance through the query. And as you propagate it, it's going to take the form of expressions because it gets more complicated as it combines the tokens. And these expressions are going to annotate tuples not just in the intermediate results, but then eventually in the final result of the query. As you analyze, as we did at that time, as you analyze what's happening to how data is used throughout the database operations, you can identify quite clearly two different manners in which the, the data is used. One is jointly, that is, for example, in a join, right? like you had in the previous example uh, in Sudipa's uh, query, um, but also alternatively. So that's because, for instance, uh, you can, for example, have a projection, and the same information is actually coming from alternative tuples in the final answer. So um, the proposal is to actually postulate two algebraic operations um, and to see how you can use them to combine provenance. Things that you'd like to have is, of course, if you, you know, like good things in computer science, right? You'd like uh, compositionality, input-output compositionality. So if you compose queries, things work out smoothly. You'd like modularity. You'd like to be able to define something for every operator. Okay. So how are we going to set this up? Imagine that X is uh, the set of provenance tokens that we use to label the input tuples. And then prov of x is the set of these annotations, the space of annotations, these expressions involving the provenance tokens that propagate through the query. And we're going to talk about relations in which the tuples are annotated as prov of x relations. So this is a relation in which every tuple is annotated with a provenance expression. In fact, more generally, we are going to talk about, talk about k relations where the annotations come from some more, even more general space, K. But at this point, the question is, what is K? <laughs> and of course, it's going to be a semi-ring, right? So on prov of X or on K, you want to have these two binary operations, the joint and the alternative. And just to summarize, you use joint use in operations like 
uh, join Cartesian product intersection and use alternative views uh, in unions and projections. Any questions? Okay. By the way, anytime. You, you saw, you, you gave the example. Interrupt the speaker anytime. We, we do that here a lot. So in addition, and that's a little less obvious at the beginning, you'd like some special annotations. Uh, so this is a notation called zero, which is, we're going to think of it as, as labeling absent tuples. You can say, what? Well, uh, the point is that as you operate on the, on, on the input data and so on, and for example, you delete some of the tuples, you'd like to see what happens in the output. And setting things to zero is a very nice and elegant way to, to track this through provenance. And you'd like to see what is going to be zero in the output if something becomes zero in the input. The second uh, slightly unusual annotation is one. So the annotation one corresponds to data that you choose not to track. So remember that you have those provenance tokens that you label a tuple with, and you want to know what happens to that tuple. How is that tuple used in throughout your transformation, query transformation, and so on? And the question is, if you choose not to track that, well, you can label it with one. And that will one will sort of go along and not bother anybody else until <laughs> the end of the calculation. Okay. So how does this work? I did not emphasize before, but uh, I had this uh, conjunctive query here that really was calculating Sudipa's uh, data. So this is uh, Sudipa's table is S of X and Z, and it is the... So this is a join followed by a projection. Um, it's the simplest example that I could think, so it doesn't take too much space. But uh, uh, as you have more complicated uh, relational algebra expressions, you, these kind of expressions can become even more complicated. So what you see here is an abstract way of what I was trying to tell you with those suggesting how those calculations with yes and no, with the access control, or with the uh, confidence scores were proceeding. So if you think of these tuples as labeled P and Q, R, S, and T, then um, the tuple that cats eat gray stuff would be labeled with P times R plus Q times T. Notice the plus there, that corresponds to those alternatives that we were talking about in the beginning. Well, the tuple cat eats red stuff is labeled by P dot S. And for the moment, this is an abstract operation. It's the abstract version, for example. So P R plus Q T is the abstract version of that 0 0.72 calculation that I showed you before that takes the maximum between two products. Okay. So with this setup, it turns out that you can do the following nice things. You can define uh, for each uh, select project join union operator uh, in terms of, of K relations, of relations which are um, annotated with elements from this space, which for the moment is ambiguously the space of provenance expressions and some space K, but we're going to see exactly what the general form is. Uh, and then if you do that, then compositionality follows from the usual compositionality of algebraic expressions. So that's why algebra is, algebra is giving you for free a whole bunch of things. So um, that gives us a K relational algebra. That is a relational algebra on K expressions, uh, on K uh, relations. The K relations having tuples annotated with elements from some k. So this k is a space of annotations. It is now an algebraic structure, k, with operations plus, times, zero, and one. And the question is, OK, you have two binary operations, two constants, but what actions do they satisfy? And the nice thing is that it turns out that uh, if you want the k relational algebra uh, definitions to satisfy the 
standard query optimization equivalence, but I'll say standard for bag semantics. Because there's one thing that we want to include in this whole thing, and that is bag semantics. Because if you do have set semantics, then you have, for example, union would be idempotent. But that's not the case with bag semantics. So we want to cover everything. Uh, but in fact, these are the, the optimizations which are used uh, typically in, in an optimizer if, if the optimizer works on relation algebra expressions. And this happens, if you want those things to hold, exactly when this k is a commutative semi-ring. I'll have the definition of commutative semi-ring in a moment. It can define can be defined not just on you know select project join union, but you can also give a definition for conjunctive queries, unions of conjunctive queries, non-recursive data log, and as you will see tomorrow, full data log and more. I'll have at the end I will have some sort of uh, mostly for the purposes of giving you uh, bibliographical pointers. Uh, how far this, this framework has been extended. And things that you are used to, so for example, translating between unions of conjunctive queries and SPJU back and forth, all these translations are sound in K relation algebra as long as K is a commutative semi-ring. So what is a commutative semi-ring? Uh, so not sure uh, how much I can rely on, but let's hope that we are familiar, you know, with uh, with rings, which are things like the integers and uh, polynomials with, uh, for example, integer but coefficients, but also more generally, uh, you know, the, the real numbers, the complex numbers, etc. A semi-ring is actually a ring without additive inverses. So you have a plus, but there is no inverse for plus. So plus has to be associative commutative with identity zero. That's as usual in every ring. Times has to be associative. The identity is one. So that's actually some definitions of ring do not include that, but we do. Then times has to distribute over plus. That's very important. So if you want things like um, pushing uh, projections into joins or into uh, unions and stuff, all, all that good stuff that we're used to, um, this better be distributive. We just, you, you never thought that you're using that as you were checking those identities, but you were. And finally, uh, times is commutative. I'll spend 20 seconds on that. The use of semi-rings in computer science is very old. I mean, computer science is not very old to begin with, but okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it goes back to the late 50s when people like Chomsky and Schutzenberger were actually working on uh, formal languages. And there is a very natural way in which semi-rings are used to generalize properties of formal languages. Um, but in formal languages, there is no natural uh, commutativity of multiplication. So most of those applications, so you're going to see, you know, you look at uh, the entire chapters in handbooks and, and encyclopedias and so on, but those things uh, assume that multiplication is is not commutative in general. For us, it is commutative, and that's because, you know, join is commutative. <laughs> um, and that makes an interesting difference, although it is actually also uh, useful to know results that are more general than that and see how they apply. And Dan's going to say a few things about that, maybe about. Things like, so those of you who know about Kleene algebras and the wonderful, wonderful work of Dexter Cose, and maybe that clicks. Remy? Yeah, so for the second to last row there, yeah. how important is capturing all matrices? A times zero to, um, so you see, zero is supposed to annotate absent tuples. So if you have a tuple and you join it with a tuple that's not there, there's nothing to, that comes out of it. So I find 
I find it inevitable, right? Can you do something without that? I don't know. I mean, there's always somebody who uses, <laughs> who generalizes things. That's a, that's a, it's a, it's it's not a theorem. <laughs> yes. Uh, a rule that is not used, but it's, that seems to be sometimes implied, is the fact that you cannot get zero by other means. So you don't have a plus a and b, so that a plus b equals zero. <laughs> Yeah, so what happens is that in order to make that thing work, we had to do, for example, so in order to present the semi rings, so what Pierre is saying is that um, sometimes there is no natural zero, but you kind of have to adjoin it if you want a semi ring. That's not what Pierre is saying. Okay, what is Pierre saying? <laughs> so take Z, uh, the set yes. of uh, integers, relative integers. Yes. Uh, it's a semi ring. Uh, but if you start using it, you will get weird things where uh, you will get a zero uh, just because you had you have summed up. Uh, a ah, yes, one. yes. He's talking about positive things. Yes, yes. Yeah. So in in semi rings which are which are not positive, weird things can happen. I agree. But yeah. um, most yeah, of. But so in, in retrospect, would you would you think it's a condition that would need to be added or? Uh, I I would. I would add it if I want to keep this idea of zero labeling absent tuples. But I'm open to some kind of uh, interpretation that says, well, this tuple is, is, is a ghost. <laughs> it's, it's not really absent, but you know, it was, there was some difference somewhere that, that took it out, but you still want to think of it as still being around. Who knows? Right. So, okay, thanks. Okay, so um, examples of semi rings. Uh, we, we've got a lot, and you have already seen some, but maybe not in a very systematic way uh, in, in Hung and uh, in uh, uh, Yun Jung's uh, presentations. Um, well, any ring, of course, is a semi ring. So is any distributive lattice, it has to be distributive. That's a bit of a subtlety. And therefore, any Boolean algebra and so on. But what I want to emphasize is that there is one semi ring that's very important because annotating the tuples with true or false is actually giving you set semantics. So everything that you have about K relations, when you make K to be the Boolean semi ring, specializes to the usual relations, which are sets of tuples. Just as well, Everything that you have about k relations when k is the natural number semi ring, the one in which you have plus times and so on, um, is in fact what's called bag semantics for positive relation algebra. There are interesting things to discuss beyond positive relation algebra as to what to do with, uh, with bag semantics, but these certainly are the, the basic applications and. Uh, even though in databases we interpret the uh, natural number here as multiplicity, I'll just throw something out there. In my work with Erich Gredel, when we apply this in general to, uh, to, to first order logic or fixed point logic and so on, uh, natural numbers actually were counting the number of derivations in which a certain result can be uh, obtained. Yes? Should the k here be a union 0? So 0 should belong to k, right? Yeah, 0 belongs to k. But the natural number starts... No, they don't. Ah, you'd be so in trouble in my class. <laughs> <laughs> this is like question 00.1. Uh, all the students say, is 0 a natural number? And I have to say, in my class, it is. <laughs> this is this is the overall consensus that it's better if we consider zero a natural number. But I, I I know exactly what you're talking about. So the other guy that starts at one, we call them the positive integers. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, earlier you alluded to idempotence, and you know we get that yeah. obviously sometimes, but not always. Does it cause problems, or does it give us? Uh, it, it, it causes only good things. <laughs> so it allows us to do more uh, more identifications, therefore more optimizations and so on. 
And uh, there's a whole bunch of results that only hold for idempotent semi -aims. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, I'll have something to say. This is best discussed when you have a big picture of all, all the semi-rings together, as it were. OK, the access control one, remember public, uh, confidential, secret, and top secret. So here is an example of we have to adjoin a 0 because, I mean, I could keep it a top secret, but that means that tuples that are top secret are absent. Right? It doesn't make sense. So we, <laughs> we adjoin a zero and we say tuples that are labeled zero are so secret that nobody can see them, not even people with top secret clearance, okay? Um, and, well, I'll say in a moment. That, yeah, there is this thing that, I don't know, if people, people of a certain age may recall how excite, what excitement there was when Zadeh introduced fuzzy uh, fuzzy logic and fuzzy, that were like people who all of a sudden started to write books on fuzzy mathematics. They were just trying to take everything they knew in math and seeing what happens with it if you interpret it in a fuzzy way. Anyway, uh, so that's also, by the way, so these two, by um, incidentally, are distributive lattices. But there's more. So you have seen the second semi ring here. This is called the tropical semi-ring, as you'll see discussed a lot tomorrow. Um, it can be used for shortest path. It can also be used for data pricing in a way that does not necessarily agree with uh, Paris and Dan's work. But you can think of these, these real values as the cost of using a tuple. And it, you know, it makes some sense to, if you have alternative ways, to consider the minimum, right? That is, I'm going to pay only the cheap for, for the cheap price. I have two ways of paying for the same information. I'm just going to use the, the, the inexpensive. OK, so this particular semi-ring, though, is actually isomorphic. There's an isomorphism between these two, given by uh, e, e to the minus x. And the isomorphic one uh, is exactly that semi-ring in which we did the confidence scores, the 0 0.72, if you remember. It's this one. So you take maximum and multiplication. It has a name. Um, it's called the Viterbi semi-ring. Not that Viterbi was particularly excited that uh, he was using <laughs> semi-rings, but, but it's a famous algorithm in coding and decoding and so on. And uh, it's basically what you do in hidden Markov networks. Yes, uh, hidden mark of mobs. Okay, so two, there's not enough space for me to define anything about this, but you will see Dan talking to some extent about a variation uh, on the <clears throat> tropical semi-ring in which you only keep, as it were, the top K, which is a much beloved concept in databases, <laughs> top K results. And I was very pleased to see that um, uh, I don't think these guys, Pierre, as far as you know, you didn't talk to each other, but Pierre's student, um, Jan Ramusa, in his thesis also is using a very related uh, semi-ring for some lovely results. And this one is uh, Pod's paper, right? Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, these slides will be made, uh, so under Dan's influence, all I worked hard and I put all the references in the slides. So actually, you're going to see that when you go in the PDF, you click on a reference, it takes you to the end of the slides where you see the full, uh, full reference. So hopefully, this will be uh, an additional incentive for, for the people who are trying to become familiar with this whole landscape of results to find information that they can absorb. Uh, there's more semi-rings. I didn't know about this one, but uh, <clears throat> the uh, graduate student, the PhD student of my collaborator, Erich Gradle, used it for some counterexamples. This is called the Lukasiewicz semi-ring. So here you have max, but for here instead of, uh, well, I don't, this is not a great notation, the dot, but what you do is you add 
add them. And if it's going to be above one, you subtract one. I didn't think this was going to be a semitone, but yeah, it is. <laughs> so this was um, uh, appeared apparently in some work of famous logician, Lukasiewicz, um, on many valued logics. Okay, so yeah, you can find it in our paper on uh, fixed point logic. And it has... It is itself isomorphic with a duo that Erich likes to call, okay, well, if those were confidence scores, he likes to call these scores doubt scores. I leave it to you to agree or disagree, but uh, uh, it's, you know, it's possibly some applications could be found for this. And the isomorphism is, is simply 1 minus x. Okay. Formal notion of a dual of a semi-ring? Not that I know. I mean, I said dual, but I was not being precise. But in some sense, you know, tropical and... and, and uh, yeah, then, so, I but I would like at least these two examples to fit that formal notion. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Well, let's invent it. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, Okay, how are we doing this time? Okay, so uh, after all this, okay, so now we're going to, to become semi-ring aficionados. Uh, it turns out that it is uh, an easy addiction. I've noticed at least uh, some of my friends who, who were smiling asking me, so what is uh, about what? 15 years ago, they were asked, so what's a semi-ring ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so, and then, uh, and then like five years later, boom, they were writing papers <laughs> with it. Um, but what is it that, what, what was it that, at least personally, convinced me that this is, so, so, so this idea has legs, as it, as it were? Well, um, in fact, it was this uh, fact the, the, the most general expression that semi-rings give you for provenance has some, some really wonderful properties that algebra allows you to put to work. And that's what I'm trying to convince you in this first part of the presentation. So if you assume the semi-ring axioms, just like if you assume ring axioms for expressions with in, in, in algebra. So you may recall when whenever you were taking algebra one or algebra two, I don't know when they were teaching you these things, that uh, the teacher was talking about polynomials. That is, if you, you do the, what's the American foil? You do foil, that you <laughs> multiply things and so on, and you express everything as a sum of products and so on. And they were saying, okay, well, this is, this is in polynomial form, and it has these monomials that you add up, and they have coefficients and so on. And of course, in mathematics, this has had tremendous uh, applications. And but it turns out that you do not need the ring axioms necessarily. The semi-ring axioms are sufficient. You take every provenance expressions, and you use the distributivity, especially semi-ring axioms, and what you get is a polynomial but the coefficients are going to be natural numbers, okay, as opposed to, in general, integers or real numbers, if you like that. So this, this particular semi-ring, this is a standard mathematical notation for polynomials whose coefficients are natural numbers, whose indeterminates or variables, if you like, are from some set X. And this is also what's known uh, that these are, these are uh, polynomials in commutative variables. That is, you write the variables like X squared, Y, Z to the fifths, but you can also you know, think of it as Y to the, Y, Z to the fifths, X squared, doesn't matter. So these are called commutative variables. I emphasize this because in formal language theory, the polynomials are not commutative. You still get some really interesting results there, but, but it's, a, it's an important difference. 
commutative polynomials are easier to work with, commutative variable polynomials. So it turns out that this particular semi-ring has an algebraic property that, you know, if you love algebra, which unfortunately was instilled in me from an early age, um, and I know some other people, analysis was instilled in them from an early age. Uh, if you love algebra, then you kind of have a lot of fun with these uh, properties. Okay. I mean, I think you should be grateful I'm not even talking about category theory. <laughs> I'm, I'm making a deliberate effort not to talk about category theory. Thank you, <laughs> My pleasure, Pokemon. <laughs> okay, so it has so, so this particular semi-ring has a very useful property that algebra is called a universality property. The other thing to observe is that these provenance polynomials for positive relation algebra are p-time computable, so therefore they only have a polynomial size in the data. So this is actually, this, this was a remarkable practical fact. Not, not that it has p-time com complexity, but it was a remarkable practical fact because we were actually able, in the first application of this whole work, which was the orchestra system, uh, which is uh, has a um, T.J. Green and Grigoris Karvunarakis, two PhD students that Zach Ives and I uh, supervised at that time and who are now established members of the community, uh, were able to implement provenance in the form of these polynomials with only a 30% overhead in the amount of data. And, I, and in those times, you'd go and start talking about provenance and people would start laughing and say, well, do you want me to use uh, 10 times more space than the data would take by itself? Because that was the impression they had. But that's not true at all. Of course, you have to be clever because we use the graph representation that to, uh, made uh, a lot, exploited a lot um, uh, common sub-expressions. That made a big difference. So the monomials of provenance polynomials uh, correspond to alternative logical derivations. There's a very nice structure uh, in these polynomials. They are actually proof trees in non-recursive data log. And also, in general, in data log, they correspond to logic and, and, uh, and so on. So here, here is a beautiful um, reading that you can have from the polynomial itself. So let's say you have a tuple T and its label, its provenance after you've calculated it is say 2R squared plus RS. R and S are some provenance tokens. So therefore they label some tuples in the input. What does it mean that this tuple T has provenance 2R squared plus RS? It means that there are exactly three derivations of this tuple through your query. Why three? Well, there's two of them right here when you say two, these two, two R squared. And those two actually use R only, but they use R, each of them uses R twice. So the exponent actually tells you how many times the tuple was used. More interestingly, it doesn't even have to be the same tuple. It just means that it uses tuples labeled R. So you can actually have multiple tuples in the input labeled with the same token, and this tells you, oh, I'm using uh, tuples from a particular subset of tuples that are, you know, that come from Dan's data, <laughs> for example, right? Uh, I'm using them exactly to, two of those. Uh, and then the third derivation is RS, so that derivation uses R and S, uh, but each of them just once. So these polynomials actually give you a very close, uh, fine grain reading of how the input data is used in the output. So how do we specialize provenance for applications? Okay, so suppose we have provenance tokens. Suppose we have two semi-rings, K and L. One of them is going to be the polynomials. 
And suppose we have a homomorphism. I'm not going to define, but it's pretty clear. It preserves the plus and the times, the 0 and the 1. We have a homomorphism from K to L. The following two propositions hold. First, any function, the for all f, any function f from x to k, that is any way of giving a valuation of the provenance tokens in any semi-ring k, has a unique extension that E with the bang means unique extension. That's a homomorphism from polynomials into k. So if you give yourself an evaluation of the provenance tokens in a semi-ring, then that uniquely extends to an evaluation of the full uh, polynomials in the semi ring. So that's the universality property I alluded to earlier. And the second crucial property is the following. For the moment, please ignore the polynomials and think here just about two semi rings, K and L. And you have a homomorphism that changes labels. So it's a homomorphism from K to L. So if you have here K relations, and you apply that homomorphism on the annotation of each tuple, you get an L relation. And the same in this bottom line. But the way in which we're going to use it is going to be K is going to be the, the polynomials. So it turns out that this also commutes, where here what you have from K relations to K relations is queries from particular programming languages, query languages. And we were able to prove this fundamental property, we call it query commutation, for an impressive, to me, <laughs> surprising uh, number of, of query languages. Of course, for in the first paper we did, it, we proved it for conjunctive queries, unions of conjunctive queries, uh, positive relation algebra, non-recursive data log, but we also proved it for data log. And then later, we also proved it for uh, semantics of some extensions uh, with for business processes. And then we also proved it for first of the logic. And we also proved it for fixed point logic. So there's something there that this property captures that is very reassuring. Some assumptions on the, on the semi ring, right? Well, in order to give the semantics, you need the assumptions on the semi-ring, yes. You also need the homomorphism to, to be continuous. Yeah, if you have, yeah, but I'm just, Dan's going to say a lot more about that. So, so the deal was I don't say anything about recursion. <laughs> this, last, this last one, that's not, I mean, so because this only works for particular queries. This one is a standard uh, left adjoint. This works for particular queries, but it worked for so many different query languages that, you know, it's kind of pleasing to know. So I'm going to just apply this. You, you right it, you also extended it to first order logic. Yes. Yes. That's no problem. Well, it is. It's a big problem, but. I, I have two lectures today, so I chose I chose to discuss that in my second lecture. This is not fair. It's not a fair answer. I realize, <laughs> but I'll have I'll have something to say there. Yes. Okay. So uh, so this is how you apply those two propositions, and now you see if you have here p times r plus q times t, you just evaluate that. In a particular semi-ring, this is the example with the Viterbi semi-ring for confidence scores, and you get 0 0.72. Yeah. So what does it mean? It means that you can compute provenance abstractly, and then you can apply it for various applications. In particular, any application that's captured by a semi-ring. Of course, there are also applications which are not captured by semi-ring. Okay. This is, so uh, I only have four minutes. So I'm going to quickly show you a picture, but I will come back to this picture at the end of the, uh, at the beginning of the next lecture. Okay, so don't worry if you don't get everything. Now, the other thing that, that was actually remarkable when 
for us when we did this work is that all of a sudden we found that different, it looked completely different approaches to defining provenance. They were all particular cases of semi rings. It's like, uh, yeah, how is that? Um, there's a there's a play by Moliere where there is a guy who said that he never knew he was doing prose. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I when I write a letter, I'm doing prose. Yeah. So people were doing semi rings without knowing they were doing semi rings. Okay. Okay. So, um, well, I'm just gonna don't 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 try to understand what I'm saying. So Boolean positive expressions. I'll be back to this. Okay. There is a semi-ring called which tuples are being touched. Uh, there's a semi-ring uh, for Y provenance. That was a very influential paper. There is a semi-ring called TRIO for, for a work that was done at Stanford in Jennifer Widom's group. There is a semi-ring. Uh, and this is the picture I want to show. Okay. So... Because I, I, I did le learn in my long career that it's good to end that even if it is not really ending, it's good to end on a high note. The, in this picture, there are all semi rings. Up here is the polynomials. They are, in some sense, the most general semi ring uh, provenance. But right below, these are polynomials in which the coefficients are Boolean. And these are the ones that you would like to do for set semantics. Yes? Uh, this is trio. This one is a little bizarre. We, we didn't know what to make of it until TJ Green had, had an idea of how to see this. Uh, so this one here, you can see the set of bags. And TJ realized you can see this one as bags of sets. <laughs> OK. The Y provenance that, uh, that Wang Chu Tan with Peter Bunneman and uh, Sanjeev Khanna introduced can be seen as sets of sets of witnesses. Another semi -ring. And then, of course, are the Boolean expressions. This one here was the one that was originally called lineage, which really only collects the tuple IDs of every tuple that can be in one way or another used in the derivation. Uh, it was called lineage, but lineage now is used in three different ways. So I just renamed it to which. And there is a very exact sense in which provenance higher is more informative than provenance lower in this picture. The sense is that every arrow that you see here is a subjective homomorphism. It's important that it's subjective because it means that everything that's in the image can be expressed by typically more than in more than one way in the source of the arrow. <coughs> I'll be back explaining all this and all the item potents and absorbent at the beginning of the next lecture. Uh, uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, we have time for some questions. If you go ahead, Paris. But you had this very nice observation that you don't need to tag it's happening with one, but you can say something. Does this mean that you can kind of tune your, your provenance polynomial to be smaller or bigger depending on the tags of your data? Yes. So what you can do is the following. Instead of uh, labeling every tuple in the input, so that, that's sort of the most general one. You, you basically, we use tuple IDs. So, so the provenance tokens were the tuple IDs of every tuple in the input. But you can abstract, you can lift your level of abstraction and say, I don't care which of these bunch of tuples is used as long as I know it's one of those. And you take, for example, all the tuples from Dan and you label them with D. Take all the tuples from value, label them with V. Now you look at the final provenance expression, the polynomial is just going to be a polynomial in D and V. It's going to be smaller for you. Yes, and it's a lot, a lot smaller. So, how, so what does the selection do? Selection, <laughs> so selection, selection is basically, 
it's like joining with a relation that um, has zero or one. That is, if it satisfies the condition, it's zero. Uh, if it doesn't satisfy, it's one. So that was not a difficult one to, to get. Sorry? It's not recall. It's not like physical in the That's the selection happening. Uh, no, but I mean, in what sense do you, would you say the other operations are visible? Well, they are visible by a product as a choice. Yeah, but for example, plus could be either from projection or from union, so it's not like you can tell. Um, but if you think of selection as joining with zero one, it's a kind of join. Yeah, I don't know. Yes, Joey. Well, I think you can think of this in the same way you might think of join orders being elided by multiplication, right? There, there are things that we might think of as being constraints on plans, but we want it all to be commutative. So we pull the selections to the very top and right, they go away. So there's some details here that make math pretty where we ignore things we might want to know otherwise, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, can you say a little bit about what you get out of uh, specializing the uh, semi ring even further because you said even uh, earlier in the talk that implementing the provenance polynomial has a manageable overhead. So if we specialize our semi ring even further, is it even yeah. less overhead? So, so if, more if, if you choose not to, not to, okay, so for sure. there are problems with data, log, but for, for in the absence of recursion, all these are polynomials. But uh, if you go here, for example, the polynomial is a lot smaller, it's called an absorptive polynomial. And you could choose to only keep this provenance if you are only interested in, for example, um, confidence scores and probabilistic interpretations and things like that. What you cannot do here is, of course, a reason about the number of uh, about multiplicity. But a lot of people are totally happy with that. So, are, are we only talking about sort of runtime performance there, or does you know do, do, do these additional properties of our simulation give us more? I don't know query optimizations that we could do or something like that? Uh, yeah, so you, well, so the query optimizations are about the query, not about the provenance, right? Uh, I think of it as, so that's actually a very subtle point. Thank you for asking. Uh, the query optimizations happen. Question is, is your provenance collection still sound if the query has been optimized? And uh, that we have a good understanding of. In particular, remember that the access control semi okay? So that is some kind of distributive lattice. It's a very simple one, uh, con uh, public confidential figure. Uh, but for example, what if you want uh, three different levels of, of confidential for three different departments, but they're not comparable with each other? Turns out that's not a distributive lattice. And what that means is that if you apply uh, on your query an optimization that uses distributivity of join over, then, uh, then you cannot actually wait until the end and apply the provenance. So, so, so that's informative, I think, as a, as a way of dealing with. So you, you can choose, and of course, uh, when we were working on our orchestra, of course, Zach said, oh, no, we're going to implement the most general one and for every tuple ID. Uh, but I can see a variety of possible applications. I don't know what Pierre, Pierre also has implemented uh, with his group. With the same problem, but we implement the most general one, but it's, it's not uh, the most efficient practice. Yeah. Sure. So I think this may relate to the question in the sense that when you go down this hierarchy, you're eliding information that is essentially asserting equivalences in the underlying language. You're saying, yeah. because I'm not keeping this information, I'm asserting that either way it could have been set up higher up, I will consider it to be equivalent lower down. So, um, for instance, in the case of selections, if we if we cared about equi joints for some reason, let's say we were doing um, outer joints where they're not uh, distributive, right? I guess it's exactly the example you're making. You need more information than the top of this picture, right? right. Yeah, so it has something to do with the equivalent, the axioms of your, your language. Yeah. Right. An interesting uh, uh, question is the following, which I will ask of, uh, of Dan's and other people who are into probabilistic data, and so on. 
Well, if you only keep this kind of provenance, you are limited, uh, which is Boolean expressions, you are limited in reasoning about multiplicity. And if you care somehow to do probabilistic databases, but still you care about multiplicity, it's not clear how to marry the two of them. But in practice, uh, SQL system use the back semantics anyway, so uh, yeah. you have to deal with multiplicity anyway. Because so what do you do? Well, you, you just keep possible, but on every total. Well, another possibility is to use uh, your work on semi modules. Okay, that, that, yeah, let's talk about that. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for that, for that can give you the aggregate and also distribution over the possible aggregate. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you. Three uh, to go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.